Four Wing Cold Lake, located just three hours east of Edmonton, Alberta, is the home of Canada's largest tactical fighter training range and the place where all fighter pilots are trained. The unique part about uh, NATO flying training in Canada, we have some, uh, some several things which make us uh, an advantage over most similar training uh, places in the world. First is our airspace, which is uh, absolutely huge. Our low-level training area goes from uh, Prince George, B.C. to Flin Flon, Manitoba, north of 60 and just south by uh, Edmonton. We can fly down to 250 feet in that area. So comparatively speaking, uh, if we put that over Europe, that's uh, almost all of Germany, Switzerland, France combined. So it's quite a huge training area. Uh, we have the Cold Lake Air Weapons Range, which is located approximately uh, 40 kilometers north of Cold Lake. And it's a rather large range, uh, uh, approximately 100 nautical miles long and 40 nautical miles wide, along with airspace that uh, encompasses approximately 200 nautical miles square, uh, which we can conduct large uh, force uh, exercises for training. Uh, the practice bombs they use here at 410 Squadron are exactly that, they're practice bombs. They're not high explosive bombs. Uh, they have the same shape, size and character flight characteristics of a normal bomb. However, when they do hit the ground, they don't explode. It's called an academic bombing range. So you go down there, everyone flies around, kind of a, a racetrack pattern and you have practice bombs that you drop off your airplane. We have different profiles we fly. Uh, right now we're, we'll be practicing 45 degree and 30 degree bomb deliveries and 30 degree strafing, which is using the gun to shoot at a target. And you just go around and you, you try and hit the target. And it's all happening really fast. You get about uh, 15 seconds on the uh, downwind to uh, kind of keep track of the airplane in front of you, set your uh, pattern spacing. Uh, debrief your last uh, uh, drop, uh, see what went wrong and try to improve on the next one. That all happens in about 15 seconds and it's time to roll in for the, for the next attack. If you ever want to go on a, a good puke ride, that, that would be the one. You do a 5G pull off the target and that's a 5G, it's a fairly long pull to uh, 20 degrees nose up at about uh, 500, uh, over 500 knots. Climb up to about 20,000 feet, and then it's a big level off out there, and then a, a big dive bomb again. It's basically about a 20,000 foot roller coaster at 500 knots. These five students are almost finished their eight month basic fighter pilot training in the Hornet, also known as the F-18. It's been a long road for these pilots. The 410 course in, for a fighter pilot is very much the, the culmination of four years and the final uh, official course that they will go through. After they graduate here, they, for all intents and purposes, are F-18 pilots, and they can uh, say that. When Truth Duty Valor returns, the ups and downs of fighter pilot training. A fighter pilot's day starts early, and as we learned with some uncertainty, it takes perfect weather and a mechanically sound jet before anyone is allowed to go up on a mission. We've got uh, we've got at least two right now. How's it looking there, uh, sir? How's it looking? Yeah. <laughs> we have two, and uh, they're looking at uh, two more. Small things can go wrong. Uh, we have minor defects which get corrected almost on a daily basis. Uh, there are major snags, which we try to get them rid of overnight, and then uh, the next day they can fly again. For about uh, every, every mission, which is about one hour, 1 1.5 hours, we do about, depending on whether the aircraft is broken or not, about, uh, it could be one whole shift, which is eight hours of maintenance on it. So the maintainers keep them flying. Yep. Are we, uh, has a decision been made on what we're doing with the schedule here? No, I just leave it, everything's just shifting to the right. So everything's just going a little bit later, so just leave it as it is right now and we'll amend as required if the jets go away. So we're we'll relaxing an hour, did I hear you say? Okay. This is called the ops desk. It's just that whenever there's aircraft in the air, we always have a pilot at the ops desk. I have a radio here and they can call in. They can ask for information, change in weather. If they need uh, help going through a checklist or they're having an emergency, they can call and ask for some assistance here. And. Uh, 
and then just basically coordinate between the maintenance side and the flying side so we know what's going on, which jets we're going to use, and just get the paperwork out of the way. The other thing that's important here is uh, the actual weather forecast in Cold Lake, which is this segment here, and it shows us uh, what the weather we're expecting. So, but today the weather's great. The weather may be great, but without enough jets, these guys might not fly this morning. As usual, we caught them studying for their anticipated missions. First time flying the Hornet is like every other trip. It's awesome. I love it. And, uh, you know, my next trip is a solo. The solos are awesome because there's no one in the back seat beaking at you, telling you how you should do it. But I'll be up there thinking about something tactically, fighting or whatever, and then I'll, you know, look back and realize that I'm in a Hornet and I'm fighting some guy. And, you know, I'll just start smiling because it's awesome. It's not the first trip right away where you do your full afterburner takeoff. It's not until about, I think, the third trip. Uh, but as soon as you get those afterburners in, it's like a, a completely new aircraft to fly. You get pushed back in your seat and you, you go for quite a ride. You take off quick, uh, you accelerate quick, and you have to actually worry about the sound barrier when you're climbing up uh, because it does accelerate so quick. And that was, that was a thrill ride. All right, what do we got? We, uh, if one of us breaks, can we go single ship to the range? Yeah. I'm still on the schedule, it's just later. Just later? Yeah. In a brief, which is before the flight, we will outline what we're going to try and achieve on the mission. So we always give ourselves some objectives so that we can focus our attention training-wise on what we're going out there to do. Then we'll run through exactly what we're going to do airborne, we'll run through what they should see, we'll run through a few what-ifs. If things quite don't go according to plan, these things might happen and how they should react to those. Uh, and then we'll sum it all up at the end. Uh, we want to achieve 100% sort out there today, and if you don't do that, then we'll have to ask some questions uh, and maintain mutual support from flights on to one jet. We're done. We're shutting down for the afternoon, allow maintenance to regroup and regenerate yeah, some aircraft. There's five domestic cars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the operations officer just came in and told us that we've fallen from three aircraft today down to one as a result. We needed three aircraft to get this mission in with uh, two blue air and one red air, one bandit. Uh, we can't get the mission in, and I guess we're gonna be canceling the flying program for the day. Of course, disappointing when this happens, but it, it's expected in this industry. The jets can't work all the time. The weather could be a factor all the time, and uh, you gotta be flexible. Next on Truth, Duty, Valor, learning to live with the power of G. Well, this would be... Negative G, and this would be positive G. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> very mentally demanding and as you know studying for anything for a long period of time or concentrating intensely for any one thing on a long period of time mentally drains you uh, but it's also very physically challenging and throwing the jet around the sky uh, in every direction conceivable to man uh, at up to 7.5 G uh, does take its toll on your body. It's a lot more work than I thought it would be. Uh, not kidding myself. I, I like working hard and it's part of my character but uh, it is a lot of work. Uh, probably more than what the average person would think. It's easy to think that flying a jet involves as much physical activity as driving a fast car. But pilots learn pretty quickly that this is a job you have to keep in shape for and that you can't let the G-force bring you down. Being a fighter pilot already, I'm, I'm used to it, or the guys are used to it, so we don't think of it very much. However, if you come back off a couple of weeks leave and get back into the jet and uh, fight a full-up fight in a Hornet, you come back and you are physically drained for the rest of the day. Uh, passengers that we take up in the aircraft get down and then they basically don't do anything for the rest of the day. It's very demanding. Yeah, it's hard on your neck and plus you put a helmet on there and uh, you're trying to look back over your shoulder and it's just uncomfortable and you have to be very careful not to hurt yourself. But more importantly than that, you have to be very careful not to become unconscious because if you pass out, there's a good, good chance you'll be taking the dirt nap as they say. 
It does help if you are of a stockier build and have more m muscle mass uh, than if you're an excellent marathon runner. Um, you want the you want to eat a lot of fatty foods and have high blood pressure is basically what you want in a fighter pilot and have and to be a short guy. Pull up to 7G and you usually don't maintain that but 7 times the force of gravity on your body your hand which uh, weighs 2 or 3 pounds is now weighing a considerable amount more than that so even moving around in the cockpit or uh, you could feel the pressure of your G-suit or the the LC vest you're wearing, you feel the pressure of that on your body and it does become quite a strain after a time. It's a different feeling, it's more of uh, being sucked into your seat by the G uh, than anything else. Well, this would be negative G and this would be positive G. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Keeping in shape isn't enough to protect you from the G. That's why the pilots wear a G suit to help them out. We wear a seat pack and our vest. Of course, we wear an anti uh, anti uh, G uh, suit. And obviously, what you don't want to do is is uh, pass out in the airplane, go nappy nappy while you're uh, flying because that's not going to be good. So as you pull a bunch of G. The blood wants to run down to the bottom of your body. It's just physics, right? Anything in the airplane wants to go down to the floor. And of course, when too much blood goes down to the bottom of your body, there's not enough left in the top of your body, and and your head is uh, needs a lot of it. So uh, your eyes are very uh, susceptible to it. But as your uh, blood pressure begins to uh, drop a long way in your head, your your vision will start to gray out. And that's kind of one of your first indicators. Oh, you know, I'm starting to run out of bit, uh, blood up here. And then you'll actually get a uh, blackout and you can lose consciousness. Which is, uh, which can be fatal, of course. Because if you happen to be pointed at the ground, when that happens, uh, you might be napping for up to 20 seconds. And that is plenty enough time to uh, end up in the, in the ground. Uh, so this suit is designed to uh, prevent that. It's supposed to give us somewhere in the order of two extra G uh, capability. Basically, it plugs into the uh, ECS system on the airplane and it inflates. Um, as soon as there's a regular valve behind the seat, as soon as it feels, that valve feels the G coming on, it starts to uh, pump air into the suit and there's basically uh, three bladders, or five bladders, I should say. One on the upper uh, thigh on each side, uh, one on each calf, and one in the uh, abdomen. And uh, the harder it squeezes your body, it's basically trying to push the blood back up there. And you strain at the same time. <laughs> Just imagine trying to push all your blood into your uh, head. That's what you are doing at the same time. And when we're up in the aircraft, we control the amount of G that we're under simply by, uh, by relaxing the stick if we start to feel a gray out scenario. So no, there's, there's no fear. Although the most each of these pilots will fly in a day is one 90-minute mission, it takes the entire day to plan and study for that mission. Every mission that we fly here at 410 Squadron, there's a briefing and debriefing. Uh, there's uh, many hours of preparation for each uh, flight, especially uh, for a new phase of flying. There are several phases, and you have to uh, go through all the ground school and the preparation in the phase. And each flight itself takes probably two hours of, of self-study before the flight. Uh, a couple hours of brief in the flight itself and a couple hours in a debrief. So I'd say for each flight, it's about an eight-hour eight day. I'm going to get into the mindset of saying, oh, I've done this before, I can do it again, because there are so many different roles that the Hornet can fly and it's so dynamic. Uh, it's quite easy to forget some of the fundamentals if you haven't briefed it. Very expensive uh, training in these jets. Uh, they go through fuel at a phenomenal rate and uh, uh, we burn up a lot of money uh, in one flight. Uh, the airplane itself is extremely expensive. Uh, it's very expensive to uh, to look after, especially as it gets older. Uh, so, uh, you know, one hour in this airplane is worth an awful lot of money. So we want to pack all the training we can into it. Uh, after we come down from flying, we'll go through a, a debrief where we will assess um, how they did perform and then uh, how we can improve on their performance next time they get airborne. So hopefully they won't make the same mistakes again. That's why we spend a lot of time in briefings uh, because it is so expensive. Uh, to go up there and actually practice what we do. Uh, we like to get it perfect every time we get airborne. Uh, we can uh, replay the flight, uh, especially for ACM engagements. Uh, everything happens very, very quickly and you're going, uh, you know, what, what just happened there? And you're not really 100% sure. You can go back and, and view it 
in slow mo over and over again and, and get thoroughly debriefed on the errors uh, that you might have made. Coming up on Truth, Duty, Valor, the jet that will take these men into battle and bring them back alive. F-18 is a very reliable aircraft. Um, it's a, it would be an excellent aircraft to go to battle in. Uh, well, I'm probably a bit biased, but it's probably one of the best aircraft in the world. In terms of uh, combat survivability, this airplane is, uh, I believe, second to none. And there have been stories of uh, you know, training accidents, uh, mid-air collisions, where one of the entire vertical stabilizers has been knocked off and the pilot did not know about it. Commonly known as the Hornet, the CF-18 fighter jet is the fastest airplane in the Canadian forces and one of the top fighters in the world. Starting here at the front is the radars in here. This is actually a hollow cone, and in behind it is a, is a radar dish, a very high-powered radar, a very capable radar in the, in the world today. And uh, this is probably one of the biggest challenges that the students face, is managing a radar as they're flying the F-18 and learning to fly the F-18. It, uh, it has a tendency to draw one into the screen, and, it's, and it is very similar to a video game screen. But the, uh, the problems inherent to that is that you want to stare at it all the time uh, to the detriment of flying the airplane itself. So part of the, the lessons that we, uh, we, we give to the students here is how to manage their, their time and their task management from looking at the radar and working with the radar to actually fly in the airplane. It's a real, real challenge for them. And uh, it's not uncommon for people to repeat trips here and repeat missions uh, just for a radar use alone and, and learning to, to incorporate that into their cross-check. This uh, right here is actually a fuel tank, and most people, uh, when you're at an air show or, or, or a similar type of uh, public function, they, they consider this a bomb, or they ask, is that a bomb? Uh, no, it is not. It's, in fact, fuel. And all fighter jets are, are very fuel critical, almost from the time they take off, because of the high burn rates of the, uh, the airplane. The F-18, with both engines at afterburner at sea level, can burn almost 1,000 pounds of gas per minute. So an enormous uh, amount of fuel consumption that goes on in full afterburn. Obviously, we don't fly uh, in that regime of flight often. We save it for you know, running to a fight or running away from a fight if you need to. Burn rate in the Hornet can be anywhere from, um, say, 1,000 pounds an hour burn rate on the ground when you're sitting on the ground up to 1,000 pounds per 360 degree turn. So that can take anywhere up to um, probably 30 seconds uh, to, to complete a full turn. So the burn rates are incredibly high. When you're concentrating all your attention on another aircraft outside and trying to fight and kill another aircraft, uh, then you, all your attention is not focused on the fuel. Unless you're intimately aware of how quickly you burn that fuel and constantly refer to your fuel, you can run out of fuel, which obviously has its dire consequences. We're often asked what the, the Cougar insignia is on the uh, on the little the fin that's on the top of the Lex, and that's just a, a squadron uh, insignia. We are the Cougar squadron, the 410 Cougars, and uh, as uh, all 410 students and instructors will wear the patch with the uh, the Cougar insignia, it just identifies that it is in fact our airplane. It's a little motivator, I guess, for the uh, the pilots and the ground crew that work on it. That as they're walking around the airplane, they see that and they know it's uh, one of our jets, and. Uh, the motto is Nocta Vaga, uh, different interpretations, but uh, stock by night, death by night. And that harkens back to World War II when 410 Squadron was a night interceptor squadron that uh, flew mosquitoes. And uh, that was a, a night intercept airplane. And uh, that's where the motto, I, I believe, was generated from. Quite a bit of lift in this sense means uh, you need quite a bit of power to sustain it. And that's, what, uh, that's why we have two engines with, uh, with almost 32,000 horsepower to be able to sustain those high drag, high lift uh, regimes of flight that we like to f uh, fight the airplane in. The, again, uh, the, a new student here, uh, with all the different challenges that uh, they face with radars and fuel management and engines, uh, one of the new, the other challenges they have to face is, is the raw power that the F-18 has. 
with two engines producing 16,000 pounds of thrust each, 32,000 pounds, roughly 32,000 horsepower, is quite a handful in full afterburner. And it's, uh, it's interesting, on about the second trip, uh, I believe we do a full power max afterburner takeoff and climb. And uh, our, our joke is they're water skiing behind the airplane because they literally, you know, the airplane's just, they're barely keeping up with it because the things are going so fast. And usually in the back, we're more concerned about them not going supersonic off the end of the runway. But it's quite a bit to handle that much raw power. It's, uh, I, you hear the, the joke sometimes, or the, uh, the cliche perhaps, that there's more uh, horsepower in this airplane than there is in the starting line of the Indy 500, just in this one airplane. Because this is such a big airplane and has 32,000 pounds of horsepower, uh, 32,000 horsepower, 32,000 pounds of thrust, uh, a lot of air goes through this engine. And these intakes, they're, they're killers, literally. Um, there have been, um, more so in the, in the US Navy, on the carrier's confined spaces, there have been people sucked down these intakes. So again, one of the challenges that's uh, on this airplane that they haven't experienced on other airplanes is being very conscious of uh, who's walking around the airplane. And um, when a new pilot says, just even learning to start this airplane, there's so many switches to throw, literally hundreds before the airplane can taxi off and take off. Um, they're so uh, drawn into their checks in their cockpit that they occasionally uh, forget to observe what's going on in their surroundings outside the airplane with the ground crew in particular. So this is the, the business end of the jet. This is where, where the, the jet exhaust comes out. And uh, I suppose equally as dangerous as the intake for in terms of sucking things, things in, whether it be uh, ground crew or, or FOD, foreign object damage that might be lying around on the ground, rocks and whatnot. Um, this is dangerous because it's an extremely hot gas. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's approximately at idle on the ground, it's around 600 degrees uh, Celsius coming out the back of this. So can you can imagine, you wouldn't want to get this too close to anybody or anything. And particularly when the power comes up on this airplane, it throws quite a plume of exhaust back and can cause quite a bit of damage, you know, blow ladders over and knock windows out of buildings if you're that close. These engines, uh, You'd speak to the maintainers, they, they do an amazing job with these airplanes. And this airplane was designed for combat survivability and for combat turnaround time. Uh, I, I believe they boast that in a wartime scenario that an engine can be changed out completely in half an hour or just over half an hour. And it's all designed with quis, uh, excuse me, quick disconnects that allow the airplane be, or the engine to be disconnected and dropped onto a platform, another one wheeled in, raised up and rebolted in quicker than anyone could change any uh, small motor in a lawnmower probably. The maintenance schedule on these is, uh, is very rigorous. They, they literally rip them down to their skeletons and build them back up almost once a year um, as they reach a certain number of hour, flight hours and they reach a, a point and they say, okay, this airplane will go into phase as they refer to it as and it takes a month or two and they, they basically gut the airplane and rebuild it back up in effect, they basically give us new airplanes every year, and uh, which is comforting to the pilots, as you can imagine. Uh, the F-18 is a multi-role fighter, in that, and we, what we mean by that is we are both have an air-to-air -air and an air-to-ground capability. Uh, we are also embarking on acquiring night vision goggles, so we will become truly multi-role, air-to-air, all-weather, day-night fighter. The, uh, the most interesting weapons on the, uh, the F-18 is the cannon, and this is located in the nose of the airplane, just behind the radar. And this thing is a, an amend, a tremendous uh, firepower and rate of fire. It uh, can shoot at about 6,000 rounds per minute, uh, 60 bullets per second. So, uh, as you can imagine, uh, it would burn up quite a few bullets, and we don't have room for 6,000 bullets. We actually carry just over 500 rounds in this drum. And uh, when we're teaching the students to use the cannon, they, we teach them to take very short bursts of it. Uh, if you go to the range and you hear this, this cannon being fired, it doesn't even sound like a gun, which is bang, bang, bang. It more sounds like a whoop. It just sounds like a, a stream of, uh, of bullets coming out. So this is a fighter pilot's office. And uh, as you can see, it's actually quite quite snug and, and we, uh, 
we often refer to it as strapping the airplane on because there's not a lot of room to move around in here. It's, uh, for me, it's a very comforting feeling to, to actually strap, uh, strap into the jet and very tightly uh, strap to this thing and you feel very secure in it uh, such that when you're fighting and you're moving the airplane aggressively, you're not moving around in the cockpit at all, you're not flopping around. In most squadrons and most of the F-18s Canada has are, are single seat F-18s. At 410 Squadron, because we do all of the instruction here, we have the majority of the two-seat versions, and we call them the family models. And uh, they're referred to as the CF-18B, their designation. And much of the same information is duplicated in the back seat and some of the safety items like the emergency brakes and the gear handles and those critical items that a, maybe an instructor would have to function in the back seat is back there as well. As well, the back seat has an override for some of the, the radios and it also has the command eject back there. So if a student was in trouble in the front and, a, and the instructor had to initiate an ejection, he or she could do that from the back seat and without the, uh, the student's input if, uh, you know, worst case scenario, if that was required. There's a lot to remember for these pilots and the added pressure of flying a multi-million dollar plane makes the training very stressful. Not too many people in the world make it to this stage of the game. The 410 course, this F-18 course, is probably the most difficult course that uh, these students will have seen in their lives. Uh, at least it was for me. You've got to really enjoy what you're doing so that you can put in the effort. It takes a little bit of natural ability, but it's mostly, uh, it's mostly dedication, hard work, and uh, to be able to analyze mistakes and uh, yourself and see things, uh, I don't know, see things three-dimensional, I'd say. And that's what we really look for here, is that a, a a prospective fighter pilot is very critical of themselves so that they're always trying to be the best so that they will win and they have that attitude going in that winning is what they need to do and they have to be able to act in the airplane uh, and think critically and in timely fashion to make uh, the proper choices so one of the, the areas we focus on is for them to be able to make decisions on their own in the cockpit to affect their their mission and the safety of their flight as well. In such a serious environment, it's important to lighten up from time to time. Poking fun at each other helps, and it isn't hard when you have names like Pinky, Bug, and Scratch. So inevitably, everyone gets a nickname. Uh, just like the movies, uh, you know, everyone refers to each other by their nicknames, but unlike the movies, it's not for something cool, and we seldom get cool nicknames. Usually call signs are there to make fun of you or poke fun at you in some way. So you screw something up or you do something, you're, you're going to get a call sign. And it's just our way of uh, keep, keeping uh, poking each other in the chest and keeping us uh, humble, I guess. Call sign's Potsy, and I was on on-the-job training, which is what we call waiting. We develop the skills of an officer while we wait for further training. So I was waiting for 410 Squadron and I was working with 416 Squadron, which is here in Cold Lake at the time. It had been about eight months since I had been on Squadron with them, and they didn't have a call sign for me. So I guess a bunch of the majors got together in Calgary one evening, and we said, we have to call Mike something other than Mike. So I said, well, uh, an email had gone around the Squadron, and someone made fun of me saying, you know, I'm the coolest guy in the Squadron, and it said something about, well, let's call him the Fonz. And they sat around the table, and they said, eh, He's not quite cool enough to be the Fonz, so we'll call him Potsy. Call sign is Pinky, and that's because uh, the first day I was here at Squadron, I kind of had a pink lock on my locker, and the uh, guys were pretty quick to pick up on that. Though I think it's red, uh, perhaps a little color challenge. Call sign is Bug, and it's actually an acronym, and I can't tell you what it stands for. I can't tell you that on camera. <laughs> In my case, I'm referred to as Scratch, and... Uh, one of the things we do in, uh, in fighters is we air to refuel. And one of my first times, uh, I went up and indeed scratched the canopy. And uh, so they were looking for something and it, it stuck. When Truth, Duty, Valor returns, danger in the sky. First uh, low-level trip in the Hornet, so we were flying around at 300 feet, so uh, that was pretty cool. Nice and fast and good fun. 
It's a nice jet, nice ride. Mentally, it's, uh, it's very challenging. It's uh, a lot of things that the students are doing here on course they wouldn't have done before. In their training up to this point in time, they've learned how to fly their aircraft types uh, quite safely and efficiently. However, a lot of things that they do on the Hornet, they're seeing and being exposed to for the first time. Fighter pilots have to keep on top of every aspect of flying this nimble jet. Knowing one wrong move can kill you adds to the stress. Doing all our speaking before we try to do these maneuvers, because you have to actually be able to talk to yourself through the maneuver as you're doing it, because the, the maneuver is, uh, is quite dangerous, and the guy in the back wants to make sure that you're able to uh, keep up with the airplane and that he's got a warm feeling in the back that everything is going well. As soon as you start saying things wrong, it's an indication that your thought processes are starting to break down, and that's a good time to maybe recover the airplane and, and re uh, reset that. It's all difficult, it's all building blocks. So each flight adds on to the next flight. You're always learning something constantly. So it's probably just juggling all those balls, keeping everything uh, in order, not to screw up. Then you need to be able to picture what's happening around you. The systems that we have in the aircraft don't give you enough to tell you all the information and, and tell you the result. They just give you uh, actual information and facts what's happening outside your aircraft. And then Although the instructors take every safety precaution when training pilots, no one can deny that it's a dangerous job. Uh, the innate nature of fighter flying is dangerous. We train uh, the students how to recognize those dangers and how to avoid them. Uh, obviously, if you've got two jets pointing at each other at range, if they're traveling at a thousand knots, uh, say in a thousand kilometers an hour towards each other, then uh, the time it takes to actually get to the same point in the sky is very minimal. So we have to teach the students how to uh, use cues to recognize that and use the aids available to them to uh, avoid each other. Now in training, we avoid each other by a thousand feet uh, in the air at all times. So that's a mechanism we use for that. One thing no amount of training can really prepare a pilot for is that worst case scenario having to eject from the plane. A worst case scenario, if uh, someone had to eject out of this airplane, there's a handle, it's, it's right down here between, between the thighs uh, as you're sitting in the cockpit, and it's uh, with 20, 30 pounds of pull, uh, you actuate that and the, the seat is ejected out somewhere, depending on your weight, somewhere in the order of 20 G uh, acceleration up vertically to get out of the airplane. This headrest, the head box here, actually contains the parachute. And unlike the, the sport parachutes, this one is very, uh, very small. It's actually a survival item. It's a last, uh, last ditch effort to keep you alive. And the rates of descent, uh, depending again on your weight, but it's like jumping off a two-story building. Uh, so quite traumatic on the body. And uh, not at all. Uh, comparable to sport parachuting. So you pull the handle, now you're out in the elements and you might be high altitude at the time. Uh, out here we might be uh, 100 miles away up north and uh, we've got survival helicopters here that will come and get us, but uh, as I say, you've got to be prepared to spend a couple nights outdoors. If a pilot survives the ejection, the second form of survival takes place when they hit the ground and they're always dressed for it always dressing for the worst case so if you had to overnight obviously uh, north of Cold Lake in minus 30 weather you want to be warm so it's not a problem you're always sweating in the, in the cockpit because you're working so hard. Attractive things we call bunny pants and they're basically uh, like a snowsuit like your mom used to dress you up in so you could hardly even move when you walked out the door that's that's pretty much what we're like when we uh, get the full, uh, full bunny suit on. This is a brand new vest for me, for us. It was developed in, uh, in the last com complex we were in in Aviano. And you can see, you know, you just put uh, some little... Uh, it's like a little space blanket type of deal. A reflective uh, space blanket kind of thing. So I guess if you got to uh, sit on the snow or what have you, and you got your fire going and... It's great because if you do ever eject and you're out in the middle of nowhere, I mean, first of all, Make sure your body's in, in one piece and no, uh, no wounds or anything. We've got some first aid stuff in here. Uh, address that right away. Find uh, you know, fire and shelter, basically, or you're just 
like the TV shows. Right? <laughs> I mean, you hit the hit the ground and it's, the race is on. Uh, if nightfall's coming. You gotta get uh, you gotta get warm and uh, and you got all this stuff to go through after you've done that. After you've got your fire going, and your shelter built. You, you know, you come down with a parachute, and so that's going to be a key part of your shelter. This uh, vest is a far cry better than the old one. Uh, of course, the old one was found that uh, uh, it would not survive the ejection. Uh, so uh, most of the contents in these pockets would not actually be with you anymore by the time you got down, depending on how fast uh, the ejection is. Paracord. Good thing about uh, landing with your parachute is you've got miles and miles of this stuff already with you. So. All you need is a knife and, uh, and away you go. Yeah, all this gear we wear, like I said before, the, uh, the military make sure we're, uh, we're, we're, we're nice and warm. You don't see too many of the civilian guys walking out to the airplane uh, wearing half the gear that we wear. Uh, we, we are prepared for basically ejecting out of this airplane at a 30 below day, 100 miles away from base. Uh, all our gear is, is, is geared toward that uh, worst case scenario. Yeah, it's uncomfortable, yeah, it's bulky to fly in, but you realize, you know, it's pretty amazing to be able to punch out of a punch out of an airplane at two or three hundred knots, uh, have a successful ejection at minus thirty, get down on the ground and say, I'm still I'm still good to go and I've got all this gear here. I'm I'm ready to spend a couple nights outdoors here. Next on Truth Duty Valor, this state of the art simulator takes us for a ride. Before a pilot graduates to the Hornet, they have to spend some quality time on the Hawk, a pretty exciting jet with an awesome simulator. The Hawk, uh, Hawk's brand new. Uh, the buttons still make the clicky sound when you push them. And the uh, Hawk's, it's a great lead-in uh, aircraft because it has a heads-up display, hands-on throttle and stick uh, switchology, so you can do most of the stuff you need to do without taking your hands off the throttle and stick to uh, to accomplish your mission. It is, uh, relatively speaking, it's a small airplane when, uh, compared to other fighters. Uh, it does go quite fast, 575 knots down low. We typically uh, operate around 420 knots, uh, about 300 feet above the ground. We're doing low altitude training. When we're uh, fighting up high, we'll be doing about 400 knots uh, with using a hard deck of 5,000 feet. Coming from an aircraft that didn't have any simulators at all and uh, knowing what the Hornet is because I've been in some backseat rides, the simulator here is just absolutely amazing. Not on the graphics and getting to know how to handle a plane, fly the plane, but the symbology for weapons delivery, for uh, getting a sight picture, for some basic fighter maneuvers when you're dogfighting in the air, is just absolutely amazing. Pretty much every trip that I did here in the air, I flew it before in the simulator and it's just a, it's just the biggest bonus there is. It's amazing. It's a place to make your mistakes, first mistakes, second mistakes, go in there, uh, learn the habit patterns of all the switchology and the checks you need to do so that when you do get out to the airplane, you're not fumbling around with some minor stuff when there's some big picture issues to take care of. Uh, the cockpit here is uh, identical to the ones in the plane and the performance is identical. Uh, you can, depending on your fuel load or what you have, uh, what stores you have under the wings, makes the performance uh, slightly different. And the sight pictures that you can you can pick up uh, planes three, four, five miles away is uh, is just just like the just like the real thing. Yeah, all the same dangers. Uh, if you're not monitoring your fuel, you can easily run out of fuel. Uh, the instructor on the console can give you any number of emergencies uh, to make you have to come back and land. And usually every simulator trip you you do, there is an emergency to keep you up to speed on uh, your emergency handling procedures. So it's. Everything that can happen to the plane can happen here. Where the lakes are uh, in the local area and the Cold Lake Air Weapons Range uh, is identical to here as well. The, the lakes, the land, the landmarks. Simulators are incredible. They're a wonderful aid. The Hawk Simulator over at 419 Squadron, I'm not sure if you've been into it or seen it, but it has wonderful graphics. It, it gives you the sensation that you're moving, even though it is stationary on the ground, uh, through bubbles, uh, balloons which inflate underneath your seat, and the straps which tighten and loosen. Uh, we don't have that ability here with our CF-18 simulator, but this, this simulation time reduces the cost of flying, reduces the amount of time you actually have to get up in the air to practice it, because by the time you do get in the air, it's 100% it's uh, solid in your mind. You know exactly what you're gonna do and when you have to do it. 
More Truth, Duty, Valor when we return. With only one month left of this eight-month fighter pilot course, these five guys have become pretty tight. Good for a fun working environment and important for staying alive in the air. When we deploy in war, it's usually in the form of a two-ship or a four-ship, uh, two or four airplanes at a time. Teamwork is, is extremely important as for fighter pilots. Although you're the only guy in your jet, we never go anywhere operationally alone. We're always, as a bare minimum, a pair. And we, we do that to take care of each other. It gives us two brains, two sets of eyes, two radars, and twice the amount of weapons we would carry. In your own cockpit, you have to be able to um, use all the resources as one person, but you're, you're definitely a part of a team when you're up there. You have to have good communications with your lead, and you have to be able to uh, be predictable when you're up there as part of the team. You know, the environment we train for is you're trusting your, your buddies with your life, and they're trusting their life, and they're putting their life in your hands. No matter how many times they fly the Hornet, each one of these pilots seems to maintain a high excitement level for each mission. What's behind the big grins coming off the runway? Beta fighter pilot rules. It's, uh, it's everything I dreamed it would be, and in fact it's more. Uh, almost on a daily basis that I fly this aircraft, I'm, I'm impressed. I come down happier than I went up. 32,000 pounds of afterburning thrust can push you through the air. Uh, it's unimaginable, really. I would say one of the coolest moments of my flying career to point is my first Hornet solo. You're so engrossed with what you're doing, you're so concentrating on not screwing up anything. And then you get to a point where you, re you look back and you realize you've got this huge jet behind you. And yeah, that brought a smile to my face and I thought that was pretty cool. Being able to go supersonic and roll inverted just because I can. I always wanted to be a bird ever since I was a little kid. And so this is the closest thing to being a bird, I think, flying around like this. And uh, I think F-18 being at the sharp pointy end of things is, uh, is pretty neat and uh, just an exciting life all around. There's nothing better than flying fighters. It's the only place you can fly an aircraft like that, it, like this. It's high performance, it's exciting, it's exhilarating. You can go high, fast, go straight up, straight down, upside down. You can't do that in any other airplane or helicopter, so that's why I wanted to fly fighters. I wanted to be a pilot ever since I was uh, five years old. I saw uh, the air shows and uh, all the fighters going by, and I've always wanted to be a, a fighter pilot. So I think that that was the, uh, the best type of pilot when I was a young kid, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to have uh, done what I've done so far. I have a keen interest in space. Love to be an astronaut, but uh, it's a goal that I look, look forward to, but uh, it's one of those things you can't expect. It's, uh, everyone has uh, a very low chance of becoming an astronaut, I think, so. but I'll give it a whirl. Join us next time for another episode of Truth, Duty, Valor.